good to see you here today. Wonderful to be gathered to worship the Lord together. I uh, trust and hope that you've known his nearness this week, that you've had times of prayer in his word, where the Lord, in a very shaky world, seems very stable and sweet to you. I've uh, been praying that throughout the week, that the Lord would bless you and comfort you and encourage you. And certainly I'm praying that that would be the case this morning, that as we look at uh, Psalm 49 and this great contrast, between the one who has the Lord as their rock and their hope, and the one who is hoping in mere worldly things, that that contrast would encourage your hearts and draw you nearer to the Lord, drive you closer to Him, that He would be all our hope and confidence. May He grant it be so today. Before we move on into the uh, worship service, we do have a few brief announcements. Uh, one you've, you've seen, and I'm sure uh, have by now, a copy of the bulletin. If not, uh, Brian will be happy to bring one to anyone. I'm sure if they were to raise their hand or sneak back and grab one, that'd be all right also, uh, but we have that so that we can have a little better sense of the flow of the service, and also we can begin to use some other confessions of faith, which I know many like to use, the Apostles' Creed is wonderful, and there are also some other wonderful confessions, and it's nice to be able to uh, recite those together by having a copy of the bulletin. Uh, the second announcement is that we will be having communion today, and uh, we'll do that in the same fashion as last month for those who are here and remember. Essentially, when it comes time for communion, I'll remain up here as long as possible so that I'm not down near the elements of speaking over them and all of that. Uh, but I'll stay up here, safe and away from them. And then when it's time for communion, I'll come down and remove the lids and all, and we'll do uh, one side at a time, having you come forward. I'll have uh, someone ushering you out so that you know when to come and come up, and we'll just take uh, a cup of wine and then uh, the bread, and we'll go back around the outside uh, to your pew, and then we'll be able to share that together. Um, I have the announcement for masks. It's not relevant to this service, but uh, that is the case that today we're implementing the new mask procedure in the second service. Uh, so for those to whom that's attractive, uh, the, the way that's going to go is that we will be masked during the first part of the service, just as we are now, uh, except whenever we get to the reading of scripture and the sermon portion, that part where we're kind of just sitting and being still for uh, a prolonged period at that point be able to uh, remove the masks, have a little more ability to breathe freely. So that is uh, beginning today in the second service. Next announcement is that we will have, uh, as we said last week, we will have a congregational meeting next Sunday. Uh, because of the split services, we'll technically have two meetings, one after each service. Uh, everybody's welcome at those meetings. You're not going to be a member to attend those, but only members can vote at those. Uh, the meeting is for the purpose of voting on a motion that comes uh, through the session via the diaconate, or from the diaconate through the session to you to approve um, $8,500 for the purchase of new windows for the sanctuary. And so that will be uh, presented as a motion next week and have the opportunity to ask any questions you might have as well as to vote on that. And then after both meetings, we will tally the votes up and see what the result is. Last announcement is that we are uh, moving along now with elder training. We have two candidates going through that. Hope, Lord willing, is to have them interviewed by the session at the end of this month. And should the Lord be pleased to pass anyone through that examination process, uh, then we would be uh, desiring to present them back to you for a vote probably right near the beginning of next month. And so that would be another congregational meeting, but that's yet to be determined based on the outcome of their interview. But just know that that's coming. In line with that, uh, the session has also approved for our elder Phil Williams to take a sabbatical. He has been an elder for uh, 21 years ongoing with <laughs> great amounts of labor. He has put in a tremendous amount of work for the kingdom and been a source of great wisdom and blessing to me personally and to our session and to this church. And it is a well-earned break. And so you can pray that that would be restful for him. Uh, as I say, we'll do, it'll be a three-month sabbatical. And at the end of that, our plan is to meet him and then to just talk and see where the Lord is leading whether his desire is to step back onto the session or not to do that. That will be, of course, up to him, and the elders will talk to him, pray about it, and we'll come to some sort of conclusion. So, a whole lot going on right now, and a lot to be praying about. I praise the Lord for the way that he is uh, continuing to work and to provide for his church. I think that's all my announcements. Have I missed anything? All right, then. Well, let's move then to our call to worship, which this morning is based on Psalm 105, verses 1 to 3. If you would, please rise for that call to worship. O 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among all peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the, Lord, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. May he indeed grant us to rejoice in him this morning. Would you join me as we pray and ask him to bless us to that very end. Lord, we know that you have called us to glorify you and to enjoy you forever. To look to you as not only the fountain of life, but the source of all delight. At your right hand, you tell us our pleasures forevermore. To know you, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, this is eternal life. This is fullness of joy. From your presence there flows a river that makes glad the city of God. You fill our hearts with praise. And we rejoice that you have designed us in this way. And when we do what we are created to do, we not only reflect and display your beauty and glory in the world, but our hearts are full of joy. We find what we were meant to be and to do. We find our purpose and we can say, I am sweetly satisfied. I have all that I need. We pray that you would grant all of this and more to take place this morning. We've come in from um, a week in the world, Lord, where surely our thoughts have been stretched in a thousand directions. We've been tempted, perhaps, with fear and anxiety, with uh, doubts and shakings. We have looked around and seen things in the world that have disturbed us, perhaps tempted us to bitterness and anger. Yet here we come again into your presence to be reminded how blessed we have been in Christ, how glorious is our God, who it is that reigns over all things, and therefore the security and the peace that we can have when we keep our eyes and our hearts fixed on you. We pray that you would grant us, Lord, to remember such things this morning, and that as our hearts are indeed fixated upon you, our lips would break forth in praise, you would get glory in our midst, and we would continue to go forth praising you, telling of all your wondrous works in the world this next week. May you use it not only to encourage our hearts, but to draw still others, sinners to your Son, to find in saving grace, joys without end in him. We pray all of these things in his perfect name, who, who died for us and who taught us that when we pray, we should say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would remain standing with me and take a copy of the Blue Psalter, let's open together to Psalm. 49a and sing that song here titled Hear This All Earth's Nations.
the psalm. Hopefully we'll see a little more of that this morning as we work our way through it. But uh, a reminder to us, certainly, that uh, death is appointed for all men. We are told it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. We hear a little bit of the background to that. Why this scene of death throughout the world? Why is it this universal end of man where we live, we go through life, we go through all its joys and ups and downs, but whatever it entails, sooner or later, we come to the same end, which is that we die. Well, Paul has something to say to us that is the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5. We will read the word of the Lord there, beginning in verse 1 and continuing down through the end of that chapter. As you turn there, we remember that this is, as with all of Scripture, the word of God breathed out by the Lord, inspired by him, that is given while through men's hands, ultimately by the Holy Spirit, so that what we have is exactly what God wanted us to have. It's just perfect, it is inerrant, it is authoritative and life-giving word. And so as we read it, let us remember that this is our God speaking to us. And let us take his word with humble and thankful hearts. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like a trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, great all grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then, well, this is the word of our God. Uh, would you join me as we pray and asking him not only to plant that word, and cause it to bear fruit, uh, but to help us to understand as we look further at Psalm 49 this morning. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for the astounding the book of Romans from which we've just read, the striking things contained in it. Truly, as uh, Peter said of Paul, he writes in his letters some things that are difficult to understand. His reasoning is lengthy, and at times it takes some effort to follow, and yet the point 
remains very clear at the end of the day that here we are a people who in our first father have fallen into sin, who have accumulated plenty of our own sins, more than the hairs of our head, and yet you have shown yourself to be a God of amazing grace, a God who looks on the unworthy sinner, who loves us and sends his son to die for us while we are yet sinners. Praise you for this good news, Lord. And while we have put ourselves in an impossible situation from man's perspective, how can we make things right again? Yet you have come and done what for man is impossible. You have indeed made things right again. You have reconciled us to yourself through the blood of your only Son. And what good news this is, that life reigns over death in Christ. Mercy triumphs over judgment in Christ. That there is for the one who is in Christ a true and a sure and a lasting hope, a solid and unshakable confidence. His work is complete. He now sits and reigns in our behalf. And as surely as he is at your right hand, so surely we will be there with you in your time. Thank you for this. And we pray that you would fill our hearts with this hope this morning. You know the wickedness, Lord, of our own hearts at times. Certainly you see the wickedness of our nation, the nation's rage and plot in vain against you and against your Christ. Lord, it is easy for us to become overwhelmed by these things and to give all our thoughts and energy to politics and to national uprisings. These are not to be ignored, and yet, Lord, you've given us something far more significant to focus upon this great salvation we have in Christ and the call to go and make disciples call others to come from darkness to light, from foolishness to wisdom, from death to life. We pray, Lord, that you would remind us of these ultimate things this morning, and we would go forward better prepared, rejuvenated, energized, to share, to proclaim good news, that whatever happens in November, whatever happens in the months and years to come, Christ will still be on his throne, and until he comes, the free gospel offer will still be held forth. Repent, believe the gospel, and you will be saved. Lord, we pray that you would come now, work such things, and even more in our hearts as you please. Do that which is right in your eyes. Make us the people you would have us to be for Christ's sake. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, our sermon text this morning does indeed come to us from Psalm 49, as it is the first Sunday in the month of September. We go back to our series, First Sundays in the Psalms. So we made it through 48 so far. That puts us, as I say, right at 49 this morning. And we'll pick up reading with the title given to the psalm there. That is not a, an editorial note. That is part of the original psalm itself. We'll begin there and read down through the end of the psalm. This also is the word of our Lord. To the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble, when the iniquity of those who cheat surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches. Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice, that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet after them people approve of their boasts. Selah. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers, who will never again see light. Man in his tongue, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. And I know 
for this is God's word. May he bless us as we look at it together now. Right from verse 1 of this psalm, the psalter seeks to draw us in. He says that he is issuing a call for all peoples, for you and for me and for everyone who will hear, but to listen to what he has to say to us and to gain understanding, to get wisdom. He makes it very important as he reaches the end of the psalm and he uses that word perish. Man without understanding, he says, is like beasts. They, they, they perish. And so it's important that you have this wisdom. There is something here that he wants us to ponder and to weigh carefully. And so while we could look at this psalm and break it down as, as some have done in, in two major portions and just say, don't do this, but do this, or, or don't trust this, but do trust this, Instead, given that the, the psalmist is saying there's something here that's worthy of your thoughtful and careful consideration, I want us to walk through it in a, in a short series of smaller steps and hope that we can see how the internal logic of this psalm fits together, how it is that he is effectively building up an argument in hopes that that will help us learn to think about our lives in a more biblical way, that we'll be able to go through life situations Remember the logic of this psalm and say, this is how the pieces actually fit together here. This is how I should think through this. In verses 2 and 3, the psalmist says he's going to speak wisdom with his mouth. He says he will reveal the meditation of his heart, and this will give to us understanding. And then he lets us know he intends to do this in the form of a proverb. So he's going to issue to us a, a riddle set to music. As he reaches verses 5 and 6, he does just that. He, he puts the question to us. He lays out this riddle, which he's then going to help us to answer for our benefit, for our good. He asks, why should I fear in times of trouble? When the iniquity of those who cheat surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches, why should I be afraid? Well, that's certainly a, a relevant question for our day. That's, that's a relevant question in every age, in a world where we often see those who engage in wicked things prospering. He says, when the wicked are in power, when those who seem to you know, thumb their noses at the Lord are esteemed in the world, and they, and they do very well for themselves, when those who reject the source of every blessing seem nonetheless to abound in blessings, or when things are so inverted, everything seems upside down, why should I fear? It's an interesting question because it seems to imply the opposite reaction that many of us offer. When such things happen, we are upset, we are disturbed, we do fear, and yet the way he asks it, why should I fear, seems to imply you shouldn't. And so he's drawing us in with this riddle. He's, he's letting us know from the beginning, and the way he asks the question, I have found a way not to fear when iniquity abounds in the world. He's, he's intriguing us with the question, and he's He's trying to create in us this desire to share the wisdom that he has found so that we also will arrive at the same answer. We'll say, I know how I cannot fear, even though the world seems such a mess. And he walks through the logic of his answer in the form of this psalm. And I want us just to follow his train of thought in five brief steps. If you look right from the start of the psalm, we enter into step one of his thinking. It is the statement, essentially, everyone must die. That's step one in his thinking. The psalm, after all, we said is for everyone. You see that in verses one and two. He says, give ear, hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world. And then he uses some opposites, extremes, just to show us. I'm talking to this person, this person, and everyone in between. He mentions the wealthy, the, the fool, the, the stupid. He mentions the wise. And of all these people, everyone, the psalm says, everyone must die. If everyone must die. Verse 10, he sees that even the wise die, and the, the fool and the stupid alike must perish. And that's the reason we read from Romans 5 this morning a few minutes ago, because while there's a lot going on in that chapter, right in the middle of it, uh, the Apostle Paul, he, he thinks back on the book of Genesis, and he makes the very same point that our psalm makes. He says, uh, from after Adam sinned in the garden, he says, generation after generation, death reigned. He says, death reigned. 
When we read that, we, we can see the same thing. As we read the book of Genesis, we see it in our own experience, like all around us every day. As Genesis goes through its genealogies, you, you notice that, that same repetition over and again, and he died, and he died, and he died. That's not the most fun or lighthearted thing to talk about. I'm aware of that. We don't like to linger on it, but it's far too important to pass by. It's not something we can avoid. It's a fact with which each one of us needs to come to terms. It doesn't matter whether you sit here this morning, if you're old, if you're, if you're young, it doesn't matter if you're a man or woman, if you're someone who is pretty well off financially or not so well off financially, it doesn't matter if you're poor health or good health today, or great influence in the world or, or little known, the fact remains, everyone must die. But you must die to make a great person. Unless Christ returns first, that's how your life is going to end. Not to be a spoiler, right? But that's, that's the end of your life's story in this world. You die. And as our song goes on, it makes this point that this reality of death is, as it were, the great equalizer. Right? We begin to see it as we move from step one of the psalmist's logic to step two. From everyone must die to step two, which is... No one can take anything with them when they die. This is not money. It's not money. Look at verse 10 again. He says, The wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. That's something that's pretty easy to understand. We get that. You, know, you die and your money, everything else stays here. But we don't always live like we really believe. He's saying, he's saying, take note of this fact. It doesn't matter where you're storing it. It doesn't matter if you put your money in a leather wallet or you keep it in a purse or you shove it in an old mattress or a crack in the wall or a reputable bank or the stock market. It doesn't matter where you put it. He says, you can't keep it. It's not going with you. Not money, not lands and homes. Verse 11 says, their graves are their homes forever. Their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. In the verse 14, he says, Their form shall be consumed in Sheol or in the grave, right, with no place to dwell. He says, Soon enough, we're going to leave the homes that we currently often spend so much time and money perfecting. We, we labor to make them just right. He says, We're going to leave them behind soon enough, and our bodies will take up their resting place in the grave where. He doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't try and paste over to make it pretty. He says, they will be consumed. Our bodies will decay. So a person could choose, of course, in their will to say, I want my, my body to be encased in a beautiful casket in the middle of the biggest room, in the middle of my large mansion at the heart of my expensive estate, in an attempt to somehow retain some of that grandeur after they die. But they would have no enjoyment of those things. They would have no awareness of them. It would just be the body lying there, dead and unresponsive. Meanwhile, the soul, stripped of that body, would be confronted with the reality of a holy God. No earthly possession can be kept or enjoyed in that day. Not money, not lands, or homes. Not only that, he says, but even immaterial things, not our popularity or power. Verses 12 and 13, he says, man and his pomp will not remain. He's like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet, or I think perhaps they're better, though after them people approve their boasts. So even though other people remember them and think that they had, they really lived the good life, he says, their, their pomp is not with them now. They have lost it all. Verse 17, when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. You see the equalizer, death there. He says it's the same in the end. It's the same for princes and paupers. It's the same for presidents and senators. It's the same for, well, every judges, construction workers. It can be a nice old lady or a doctor. It can be a, a lawyer, a fast food cook, or a professor. It doesn't matter. Death levels the claim. All the pomp, all the influence, and the fame that we can accumulate in the world, it will seem quite despicable when compared with the weight of the glory of God in that day. So everything that now seems so solid and impressive, he says, it's going to pass away. Our money, our lands, our homes, popularity, power, even these mortal bodies. They'll leave us stripped down this morning. We will be exposed. 
before the gaze and the judgment seat of a holy God. But whatever we have, we can take none of it when we die. That's step two in his logical thinking. And it's in, in view of that imposing reality that the next step of our song becomes terribly important. That's step three. He says, no one can ransom their own soul at any price in that day. If we're going to die, we can't take anything with us. We won't have, we couldn't give anything to God to ransom our soul. It's a, it's a dilemma that results from our fall into sin, our having become guilty before the Lord and therefore liable not only to death, but to judgment to follow. A ransom is needed. A ransom is needed. We understand by our constitution, our makeup, the way God created us as people made in His image, we are called, we're required to glorify Him, to honor Him with our lives, to obey Him and love Him and honor Him in everything we do. And he is, he is infinitely worthy. He's perfect in holiness. He's the greatest king there ever was. So that to, to offer to him anything less than total devotion, I'm going to serve you with my whole heart and mind and life. Anything less than that could never be worthy. In fact, to give him anything less than that, to, to not obey, or to do the things that he has said not to do, or fail to do what he has told us we should do, this is to become guilty. We have violated his standard for our lives. And since he's infinitely worthy to violate that standard, it's a terrible thing. It's to incur an enormous debt before him. It's to become subject to his fair judgment, his right judgment. That's the pains of hell forever. It means we'll stand before him and we'll say you're guilty. And you can, can't repay this debt. It's what we all deserve, since this Romans 3.23 reminds us, we quote it often, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're all in this position. The only way to avoid this, the only way to escape, would be if somehow a, a sufficient payment could be offered, something to make up for what we've done. Uh, that's a ransom. Some money paid to atone, to make up for and wipe away and remove the guilt of our sins that would satisfy God's offended justice, that would free us from our debt. That's a position in which the wise person, the foolish person, the rich and the poor alike, all find themselves. Everybody equal in that sense. Every person needs to have their soul ransomed. But our psalm is very clear. It says, no mere person can ever ransom their own soul. We need to have our souls ransomed, but we can't do that ourselves. Verses 7 to 9, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. The ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. Again, the playing field is level. This is the rich who wield such power and influence in this life, who can buy their way into positions of authority, who can buy their way out of trouble or judgment in this world. In that day, before the throne of God, they will have no advantage over the poor. They haven't been able to bring anything with them. And even if they could have brought everything they owned with them, no amount of money will do. The psalmist says that the ransom of their life is costly. No payment could possibly suffice. No, no, no one can buy their way out of the grave. No one can bribe God to offer a better judgment and free them from the sentence of hell. He won't accept any payment they might have to offer. What would money could possibly compare to the horror of sinning against this God? And even if, even if we could bring it and try and offer it to him, which we can't, it's nothing to him. He already owns it all anyway. So the riches and the pomp of the most esteemed man or woman in the world, the most untouchable in this life, those who just live and often are treated as if they're above the law, all of their wealth, all of their pomp will seem and be worthless on the day of death and on the day when they stand before Christ and he judges without favoritism. One commentator puts it well, he says, there are so many that think that wealth is all important. But death will test people in their beliefs. Such men will then bitterly regret placing confidence in the things of this world. So it would be folly to set your hope on the riches or the power or the popularity that are so sought after and so, so prized in this world. There's a warning there saying don't covet these things. Don't trust them as your security. Like if everybody pats you on the back. 
you have a good balance in the bank now, then surely it's all going to be okay in the end. Don't get angry when other people have them, even the wicked. There's a sort of indignation we have when we see the wicked prospering. But still, we pray about that. We still become bitter in soul. We feel overwhelmed, so it consumes you with hatred and anger. Don't console yourself with the thought, well, maybe one day I'll have those things in this life. Maybe one day I'll be the rich one. I'll get them back. Don't become bitter when you look around and you see those who despise the Lord having those things. No. They can amass as much of them as they may. Amass as much as they may. The fact remains, no one can take such things with them when they die. No one can use them to ransom their soul. That's a, that's a pretty heavy-hitting step in the logical flow of this song. He's essentially wiping away any hope that our present superior position might give to us and say none of that's going to do you any good. But he's doing it in order to turn right around and then shine a very bright light on that dark scene and bring us right into the heart of the gospel. And he does that as he moves from step three of his logic to step four. He says no one can ransom their own soul, but the Lord ransoms the souls of his people. No one can ransom their own soul, the psalmist says, but in verse 15, God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. He says, no, no mere man or woman could, could bring something to God to pay him off for their sins against them and say, just look the other way and let me into your holy heaven. doesn't matter how high they may rise in the ranks of this present fading world. It's almost as they won't be able to pay him off. But what no mere man or woman can do, he says, God has done. He has provided the ransom. He has paid the price we owe for us, the very ones who have offended against him. This is wonderful news. It's, it's what Paul takes up in Romans 8, 3, for example. He says, but God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. This is what the law couldn't do. With all of its rules and regulations, as right as they are, it, we could not somehow keep it perfectly. What the law couldn't do, providing a way for us to make right our wrongs and earn our way into God's favor, what the law couldn't do, God did. By sending his own son into the world as a man and then condemning our sins in his flesh on the cross. The payment that was required, sin, the wages of sin is death. Not just your body dies, but an everlasting death, the pains of hell. Christ died, not just bodily, but received for the wrath of God on the cross. He gave the payment we owe. The righteous judge wouldn't just overlook sin. He's not just going to ignore what we've done, the punishment we deserve, but we're being told in his incredible love, he would send his own infinitely worthy son to offer himself up in our place. A sufficient offering. Here is one who's not just any mere man or woman. He is fully God as well as fully man. An incredibly valuable offering. Paying our debt. Ransoming our souls from the grave and from hell. So he said in Mark 10, 45, Jesus said the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. As a payment to free us. Isaiah had prophesied it long before. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed. Paul, taking up the same sort of theme in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's good news. That's the heart of the good news. There's lots of good news in Scripture, but this is the very heart of center. But what we can't do for ourselves, providing a valuable enough payment, a ransom to save ourselves from the grave and judgment to follow, the Lord has done it. He has done it for us through the cross of Christ. So it doesn't matter our position in this world, however high or, or however low we may be. Whoever comes to him as a needy sinner, bringing nothing in our hands, just confessing our sinfulness and trusting his promise to redeem us, we're granted this full pardon. 
He says, you have forgiveness now and forever. You have the promise of eternal life. You have a share in the future resurrection glory. A new heavens and a new earth where you will dwell. And that is a world where the wicked, who boast as they may now, unless they repent, will have no share. And it's in view of that that we arrive at the answer to the psalmist's riddle. Why, why should I fear, he asks, when I'm surrounded by sinful people doing sinful things, I'm so tempted to anxiety and frustration over it all, I see them even prospering as they rebel against God, and they're getting ahead in the world. Why should I fear? But his answer is the final, the fifth step in the logic of this psalm. He says, in light of everything he has said to this point, the one who trusts in the Lord shouldn't fear when the wicked prosper. You don't need to fear because of all of this. So the person who foolishly places all their hope and confidence and their standing in the world or their wealth, thinking that they're invincible, he says in verse 14, like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd. Not only so, but he highlights this great reversal that will take place with the full establishment of the kingdom of God in the world. He says, the upright shall rule over them in the morning. You may have abused and mocked you in this life, may have had power over you in this life. He says, but God's going to flip it all back the way it ought to be. The upright will rule over the wicked in the morning. The hollowness of everything that this world prizes so dearly will be exposed to last. It will show the folly of those who boast it. I have money, I have lands, I have titles, I'm really someone. Verses 18 and 20 says, For though while he lives he counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself, he will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see life. Man in his palm yet without understanding is like the beasts that perish. So they will go away from the goodness of God, never to stand in that light again. Even the common delights they had in this world, the sunshine on their face, like the first cool autumn air, they'll never see the light of these things again. Much less the presence, the blessing and goodness of God. But on the other hand, he says, those who might have been low and despised in the world, but who put their trust in the Lord, will be vindicated. They'll be exalted. They'll be made to rule with the Lord Jesus Christ. All of that leads to the big therefore. The answer to is real. Why should the believer in the Lord be afraid? Just look at our country today. Yes, the wicked prosper. In many ways, the wicked prosper in our country. Should you be afraid? He says, no, you shouldn't. You should not be afraid. Verse 16, be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. Because their wealth is earthly and fading, yours is heavenly and imperishable. Because their homes will very soon crumble. But yours is a house made in heaven, kept for you by God. Because their pomp will soon be brought low and your humiliation will be turned into glory. We see that we can perish eventually, not rather than become bitter and angry and envious, shouldn't we pity them and pray for them that the Lord would grant repentance in faith. Rejoice that he has granted that to us and that we have a hope that is sure and lasting. The psalmist is teaching us. He says, when you look around, you can't help but notice how things are from the heaven for which you hope. You say, the wicked grow in wealth and holiness. Everything seems upside down. He says, remember to step back and take in the long view. Remember the logic of this psalm. Remember the ransom that has already been paid for Remember Christ. Remember eternity to come. And fear not. Isaiah wrote words long ago that are still true of you today that encapsulate well what our psalm is saying. He says, soon instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, you shall rejoice in your life. You shall possess a double portion, and you shall have everlasting joy. Remember that. Rejoice in your goodness to us that you would give in Christ great and precious promises that by them might have hope and strength to endure in this present evil age. It is true, we, we look around and we see things 
seeming to be out of joint, many things that do not make sense to us, many things that seem upside down. And we thank you that you have given to us in your word the ability to take in the long view, to remember the end of all things, to remember what Christ has already come and done, and therefore those things that are yet to come. Praise you for the ransom paid for us, the precious blood of Christ, which washes away our sin. We thank you for the promise of heavenly riches, Lord, imperishable, unfading, undefiled, kept in heaven for us. We thank you that you say these things are, are kept for us who are ourselves being kept by the power of God, that regardless of what may happen in this life, you will see us through it to the end. You will present us blameless before the throne of your glory in exceeding joy. And whatever was endured for your name's sake in this world, whatever of the world's ways we had to reject or walk in opposition, we will say in that last day, oh, it was more than worth it. I would endure it all a thousand times over for the glory I now behold in the face of Christ. Pray that with this truth, Lord, you would encourage and strengthen our hearts and make us bold to tell the good news of the gospel, to love rather than to hate, to share the wonderful good news with others and pray that you might call them into your kingdom, that they would not be like the beasts that perish, but gain heavenly understanding and insight and look to Christ and live. Lord, would you use all of this not only then to bless and refresh and encourage your people, but to save many others, to gather in the lost, and in all of it to glorify your Son. We pray it in his perfect name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is a sweet thing for us not only to get to look at the Lord's Word, but this morning to share in the Lord's Supper, to be able to take the bread and the wine together and to remember in such a, an evident and right before our eyes and in our hands way the ransom that was paid for us. It's declared the gospel. It's presented to us in such a wonderfully tangible way in the Lord's Supper. We hold bread, we hold wine, we reflect upon the body and the blood of Christ given for us. And we have this assurance. As, as surely as I eat, drink, and take this in, so the Lord has given to me not just physical nourishment, but in Christ he has given to me eternal life. He has preserved my soul. And I will be with him in the great day of the wedding supper of the Lamb is a, a supper filled with hope that is for us. It is uh, fitting as we're ready to take the supper, as it is a meal for believers in the Lord Jesus to take, that we would confess our shared faith together. I would invite you to do that this morning, thanks to our bulletin, uh, using the Ligonier statement on Christology. And I would ask you, what is it, Christian, that you believe and confess? We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us. Crucified, dead, and buried, he rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet priest and king, building his church, interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. What a wonderful confession to be able to recite together. I'd encourage you this afternoon, if you pulled up the bulletin and put it in your pocket or your Bible, take it home, read through that again today. Uh, just think about each line as you go through it. I'd be amazed if you read that and don't find yourself driven to prayer. At least to praise the Lord and say thank you. There is a lot of wonderfully good news wrapped up in that little confession that is well done. 
well having confessed our faith, we move and ready to take the Lord's Supper together. And we begin, as we always do, with the words of institution which come to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. There we read, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So there is a, a warning there which we would not do well to pass over without mentioning it. The Lord says, make sure that you are rightly discerning the Lord's body, which, among other things, certainly means make sure that you are understanding what the meal is declaring to us, that Christ gave himself on the cross, a ransom for sinners, that he died to bear and remove wrath from people who otherwise deserve it. Make sure you understand what's taking place at the cross, that this was our sin being punished, what we deserve. Christ was taking for us and make sure that you are trusting in him for that mercy that flows from that cross, that you are looking to him, a needy sinner, saying, Lord, I have nothing to bring, but you gave for me everything I need. Christ crucified for me is where I look for salvation and life everlasting. Make sure that you are discerning what took place at the cross and that you yourself are trusting in the Savior who gave himself there. To fail to do so would be to make light of the Lord's things, to take the supper and mock it. I don't believe any of that, but I'm just taking it because that's what everybody's doing. He says, but don't do that. Rather, come as one not, not perfect by any means, but one who is looking to Christ saying, he was perfect for me. I don't come because I deserve the meal. I come because Christ gave himself the worthy for the unworthy. I come showing that I need mercy. I need what he offered. So we come in that manner and we are filled with hope filled with joy and God's salvation. We know as partakers of this meal, it's just a foretaste. We are looking forward to a heavenly feast to come where our joy will be full. So that in mind, as we ready for the meal, let's pray together and ask the Lord to bless us. Our Father, we thank you for the great gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. John put it as plainly and as beautifully as to be said, Lord, let us not despise the words for having heard them so many times, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We praise you for the reminder of this in the supper, for the way that you meet with us and commune with us, telling us that as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are communing, we are participating in the blood body and the, the blood of Christ. Pray that as we eat and drink, you would work in our hearts to strengthen our faith by the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. We would think on what Christ has done for us. We would find our hope unshakable. Our hearts would be held fast in your grip. Our thoughts would all be how glorious our God, how wonderful that coming day we will look upon our Savior when we will feast face to face. In the meantime, fill us with the joy that comes from embracing, holding fast to your promises. Let us be ready to go out to the world and say, you need to hear of the wondrous works of my God. You need to hear of what Christ has done for me. You need to trust him, that you also might have the life that I have found. Lord, do all of this, and more as you are pleased, we pray through this, your supper, in Jesus' name. Take the supper now. Ryan is going to help us as our usher, and we'll go uh, this side first. Yes, so this side first, and he will release the rose, and then we'll go this side. As I said, if you just come forward and take uh, wine or bread, and then go back around the outside.
decide when you're done, come back to your seat, and then hold the elements until everyone's ready, and we'll take them together. Let's pray together. Father, you give to us bread and wine, as you do to all people, that the body might be strengthened, that the heart of man might be made glad. Yet we praise you that in this supper you give to us far more. That you call us to communion with yourself in Christ. And you remind us that for us you have given his flesh and his blood. That his bread sustains the body, so he is the bread of life, nourishing and sustaining the, the soul to life everlasting. His wine gladdens the heart for a time, so Christ received gladdens the heart forever with joys inexpressible and full of glory. And we pray that this meal, while a momentary thing, not be a come and gone thing for us, but that it would linger in our hearts and minds throughout the week to come. That we would remember the sweetness of your presence. The world with all of its temptations and allurements 
would not draw our hearts away from you, but we would remain steadfast, full of hope, and full of praise. And may the glory go to you alone, for you are worthy of it. We pray in Jesus' name. morning. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.